Okay, thanks, Ryan, uh, and thanks everyone for being here. I, I'm Chad Park. I'll I'll get us started now, uh, since my my clock says it's noon, so that seems like the best time to go. Um, yeah, I just want to also uh, thank you for for joining, and uh, in particular note, you know, people coming from lots of different parts of the province um, already, and that's great. That's uh, that's been the case in some of our past sessions as well, and and uh, really makes for a, for a great discussion when we can have uh, perspectives from a lot of different places. So thank you for joining. Um, Ryan was just mentioning that this is our sixth, sixth session of the Possibility Panel. And for those of you who have uh, attended some of the previous ones, the format's gonna be uh, recognizable because we're, we're um, we're taking a similar approach in terms of the way that the event will happen. For those of you for whom it's your first time, I uh, just really want to thank you for, for joining us. And I'll just out of the start say that our, our, uh, our plan and our approach to this is that it's, um, it's very interactive. And so there will be a little bit of hearing from some people speak, but there will also be a lot of opportunity for you to share your own ideas. And that's really the point of this. So I uh, really encourage you to to take that opportunity to share some of your perspectives. And one way to do that is in the chat, as is already happening. Uh, but there'll be some other, some other uh, ways for you to contribute your thinking to this as well. Um, I'll say a little bit more in a few moments about why we would have a session on talent, um, it, you know, and attracting and retaining talent. I think in some ways, it's probably a pretty obvious one when we're talking about the future of the province. Uh, how important it is, any of the, the topics, the other topics that we've covered, whether they were economic diversification, energy and climate, um, building a social, inclusive social fabric and so on. Um, uh, any of the ideas that were sh shared there and that, you know, that were put forward basically require, uh, you know, a talented, uh, a, tal a talented citizenry, let's say to, um, to enact them, and so in some ways, this this particular topic underpins everything else, and uh, and especially when we're talking about the next thirty years of this province and what's going to take to thrive and 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 prosper. Um, really important that that uh, our approach is grounded in in the ideas and activities that will that will be that will help uh, attract and retain talented people. So that's what we intend to focus on here. And I'll, I'll just jump in now into the, some of the background slides before we get into the rest. The way the, the, the flow of this works is um, I'll do some, some welcome and framing of the issue and so on, and just give you a bit of background, especially for those who are new. Then we, we kick things off with, a, with an initial set of opening remarks on the topic from some of the members of the possibility panel. And in this case, we've also got one uh, special guest as well. And so I'll introduce them in just a moment, but they'll, they'll each have five minutes to share their kind of opening ideas on the topic. And then we'll do a bit of uh, question and answer with them. So they'll have a chance to, uh, well, you'll have a chance to pose them your questions. And, uh, and then after that, we'll break out into um, some discussion groups on the, on the topic. And really important, uh, that uh, that you take the opportunity if you can to participate in those because uh, at the end we harvest everyone's ideas on the topic and, and we'll do that using um, a, a technology called Slido which I'll introduce in a moment and that will all help us to um, to generate uh, a, an output and a kind of a sense of the, the most compelling ideas that that we have amidst the people in the in the room here or in the, the virtual space I guess. We'll also have some closing reflections from from uh, a few of the other members, uh, a few other members of the possibility panel, and uh, and then we'll, we'll we'll round it out in two hours. So, thank you for uh, for joining us for for the next couple of hours, and I hope you'll find it uh, an engaging time. Just a bit of background uh, first on the technology. I think at this point. Probably most people are familiar with Zoom, but uh, just in case you're not, there's a few little tips uh, about your you turning your mic on and off. We've got everyone's mics on mute now. If um, you know if you need to speak, there'll be you can do that. But the the um, 
we're really encouraging people to do uh, to to engage on the chat. Um, and we do like to see your your faces if you can, uh, if you if you're comfortable doing so, because it helps make the 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 feel of the room a little more uh, interactive and, and personal uh, personable. So um, encourage you to put your video on, and uh, and then uh, if you uh, if you probably noticed across the bottom that there, there's some closed captioning uh, coming in. If that is, the live transcript is is uh, annoying to you or bothering you, then you can actually turn it off by going to the live transcript button at the bottom and clicking that and then clicking hide subtitle as it shows on the screen now and that'll turn that off for you. The first thing I want to do is is to to just uh, acknowledge the the land and um, I myself am participating in this session from um, what we know as Treaty Six territory, so from from Edmonton. And Treaty Six territory is traditional meeting grounds for uh, and and home to uh, the Cree, the Salto, the Blackfoot, Métis, the Dene and the Nakota Sioux. And um, we, we like to start the meeting with this as other, uh, as other meetings often do, uh, partly because we need to acknowledge the, um, the place that we're in and the long history of this place uh, well before it was ever called Alberta. Um, it kind of puts a, a perspective on it when we're talking about even just the next 30 years, um, which in some ways seems like a long time, but when we're talking about the actual history of this place, it's not a long time at all. Um, and also to recognize that there's so much to learn from indigenous culture, and um, especially as we're seeking solutions to some of these systemic and grand challenges facing the province that, that we have a lot to learn from indigenous cultures. and um, one thing that I've learned over the years is about the importance that Indigenous cultures place on the relationship to the land. So uh, I would just encourage you to, uh, in the chat box, uh, to just mention a place, maybe in the province, that is um, uh, a piece of land or a territory that, that means a lot to you. And, um, and you can explain why or what your relationship is to that, to that land. And I'll just encourage you to do that now. And um, it's interesting to see uh, the perspective that people have and how they relate to, to, the, uh, to the territory and to the land. So thank you very much for doing that. A little bit of background on the next 30. And uh, again, for those of you who, for whom this is the first session, and if you haven't uh, heard of the next 30 before this session. Obviously, you must have heard of it to actually get here, but um, uh, this is a, a, a fairly new not-for-profit organization that was founded back in November in the province. And really, it's about uh, creating a platform and spaces for, for citizens of Alberta to gather in a, in a positive kind of future-focused forum to talk about ideas for the future of the province. And um, and to do so in a in a nonpartisan context, and I'll say more about that in in a in a moment. The first project we launched with was the possibility panel, and uh, and that's this session is one of the uh, the meetings or the sessions of the possibility panel, and really that is a, a group of about thirty uh, people from uh, leaders in different communities across the province who will jointly be uh, sharing ideas and also listening to ideas of all of you and, and others um, over the last several uh, couple of months about what's possible for the future, how we wanna face the future, what big ideas we think um, need to be advanced. And we'll be synthesizing, working with the panel and synthesizing all the input we gather from these sessions from you into um, some kind of an output. We don't know exactly what that's gonna look like yet, but. Um, it will be something along the lines of 30 big ideas for, for Alberta's future. So um, that's, the, that's the intent of the panel. A key role of the panelists is to listen. Uh, and so you'll see that at the end, a couple of the members of the possibility panel will 
who have been listening intently over the next couple of hours will share some of what they've heard and, uh, and we'll be doing more of that as well. All right, so the next slide is the, um, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll introduce our panelists actually a bit later. So there's their, there's their pictures <laughs> um, and, uh, and special guest. And then the values of the next 30 are on the screen now. And I won't read them all out in detail. You can read them yourselves, but I will, I will say, um, uh, you know, all, there's a relationship among all these different values. Um, respect is one um, that I think, you know, is, is really important to, um, to highlight. And so too is long-term vision. And I think for this topic, the long-term vision is, is really important because it is prob I'm going to guess it's probably quite easy for us to, uh, to maybe even get bogged down in conversation and about the challenges of today and about what, what, what might be wrong today in the province in terms of attracting talent. And um, um, not to say we, we, shouldn't, um, we shouldn't be realistic about some of those challenges, we definitely should, but we also wanna take a, a future focused uh, lens to this and approach so that we're really focused on possibility. And, um, and there's, a, there's, a, there's a reason for that and that's to, is to try to kind of uh, focus the conversation on what's possible and elevate some of the best ideas. So we'll be doing that through the rest of the session. The next slide has the brave space principles. And these are principles that were actually introduced to us by one of the panelists, Tim Fox from the Calgary Foundation. And um, it seems they've really resonated with the participants in previous sessions. This is really about how we encourage you to show up for the rest of the time together and um, how to make sure that the, the, the conversation we're having is productive and respectful and, uh, you know, and brave in a way. So one is that we're present in the in the virtual space with each other, and it's tempted to be distracted by things, of course. But we really encourage you to be to be as present as you can, uh, to stay open to new ideas and ways of thinking and feedback, and and part of that is listening deeply and being curious. So try to show up with, to this with curiosity. Um, and part of that also is about bringing awareness to uh, our own biases, assumptions, and judgments. It's often really easy to point out what we perceive to be the biases, assumptions, and judgments of other people. Um, but, um, you know, I think it's important as well to, to show up with some awareness of what our own biases might be. Um, we hold space of trust and confidentiality. We focus on possibility. I've already talked about that. Um, acknowledge and appreciate others' gifts, strengths, and contributions. And you'll have a chance to do that in some of the breakout discussions. And all of that together, hopefully, will make it a, a space that you can feel comfortable sharing your, your ideas and being brave and courageous about, about doing so. Um, part of that, too, is about how we interact with each other. Um, so we encourage you to challenge ideas, not people. And um, and if this goes the way we would like it to go and hope it goes, then it should cause some discomfort. If everyone is in wild agreement in this conversation, then probably we haven't stretched ourselves far enough or gotten diverse enough perspectives into the conversation. So acknowledging that there will probably be people in this call who have very different views than yours, um, we just encourage you to allow the discomfort that might come from that to, to, to lead to growth. And we're all kind of responsible for taking accountability for, for doing that and for our own learning and what we get out of the session. So this is the, um, the kind of space we encourage you to, um, to play a role in, in helping shape and create. And um, I'll say more about this in just a moment, but I think that's all I'm going to say on that one for now. Okay, Anne. Uh, so now we can um, just flag for you the Slido uh, tool because we're going to be using it so those of you who aren't familiar with it, uh, all you need to do is pull out your phone uh, and you can go to slido.com on there and you'd enter the code hashtag next 30. And that'll bring you right into some of the questions we're going to be asking you. There's one in there already. Uh, you'll see it there where it says, please indicate your age range. 
so if you go in there, yeah, some of you are already responding. Thank you. We'll see, we'll get a sense of the demographics of the people who are attending this session. I'm just gonna give you a minute to respond. I said you could use your phone and that's probably the preferred way. If there's some reason why you can't do that or you don't have one to, do, to use, then you could also just open a, a second window on your computer and, and enter it through there. Okay, this is interesting. Um, yeah. Patrick, uh, Patrick Wu, I, I, I think it must be the case that you've attended some of the previous sessions because there have been some where the, the, the 55 plus demographic was the by far the largest. Um, this one is actually much more balanced and really happy to see that there are some younger people uh, on, on the line here and in the meeting because that will uh, certainly help. It, it definitely helps to have a, a blend of age ranges for the conversation. Thank you for filling that out. And that's true, age is just a number. I don't see every chat that comes up, but I, I see the odd one that comes up. Anyway, that was just to test the use of Slido. So thank you for, thank you for that. Uh, I think I've already addressed this why a session on talent, but um, I'll just say one more thing on that. And that is um, that, uh, you know, as much as the, the natural resources we have in this province are fundamental to our past and, and future success. Um, increasingly, I think in the knowledge economy, the, 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 the brain power and the, the talented people um, and the skills of the people are, are, are the major driver of, of success. And so um, really this, this is about, uh, you know, this is interconnects with every other issue. And there are things we can do as a province that make, uh, make it less attractive or, uh, you know, at, or compelling for, for people to be here. And there are things we can do that make it more so. And uh, what we're really interested in, do, in doing is focusing on what we can do to make this an attractive place uh, for, for, um, for talented people. So uh, I won't say anything more than that. And I'll, uh, we'll, we'll actually hear from a lot of different people, including yourselves on, on, on why, why, uh, why we need to talk about this. So um, I mentioned the youth perspective and uh, or in, just in that demographics. And one thing we'd really like to do is make sure that young people who are on the line here, um, that we hear from you explicitly when we're talking about the next 30 years and beyond, um, we think it's important to hear specifically from the people who have the greatest stake in that future and that's the young young people. So we just wanna create a, a moment here where we can do that. Um, just before we do, I'll, I'll say in the breakouts and other discussions, I just wanna invite everyone to make sure that the young people feel welcome and comfortable sharing their perspective because sometimes if uh, depending on how young they are, they may not, um, this may be a new, a new experience for them. So just, uh, I want to welcome you to, to do so. And I really encourage everyone to do so, especially in the smaller groups. So let's, um, if you are, if you were on 25 or under in that last one, uh, this is a special question just for you. Um, and we're just going to trust that if you're over 25, you're not cheating us by, um, by answering here. So for those of you who, who are 25 or under, if you could answer in Slido in one word, what do you want to see in Alberta's future in terms of talent? And we'll just watch them come in. Diversity, innovation, community, inclusion. Creativity, pride. Risk takers. Unleashed. Okay. A few more coming in. Great. Well, thank you. Um, 
diversity is is the most common response, and that's really quite interesting. Uh, and uh, and risk takers, so that's sort of building on the traditional um, identity, I think, of Albertans as entrepreneurial and and uh, willing to to try new things. Okay, thank you very much for that. I'll just pause to make sure we get a screenshot of that. <laughs> and I don't know if you have that. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so now we're going to move into the the opening uh, panel discussion. And four of these speakers are going to to open us up with uh, with with their five minutes each on their remarks on what's possible for attracting and retaining talent in the province. And just before I invite the first uh, speaker, I'll I'll just remind you all that um, you can use the Slido tool to post your questions to the panelists for uh, for a question and answer section, a Q&A that will happen once, the, once all four of them are done. And the other thing you can do is you can track the questions that other people are posing and you can kind of vote up the ones that you're interested in hearing answered so that we get a sense of which questions are most interesting to the people here. So I'll just encourage you to do that. I can't remember if there's a slide that will also encourage you to do that. Is there, Anne? <laughs> no. Oh, yeah, there is. There we are. OK. Um, so there's where you go. Thank you. So the first uh, speaker is Irfan Raji. He's the founder and CEO of Mob Squad and a venture partner with Relay Ventures, among many other uh, elements of his bio. So um, I'll turn it over to you, Irfan, to get us started. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Chad, uh, for the opportunity, and, and frankly, thank you for your volunteer leadership in, uh, in putting together uh, the next 30. I think it's people like you that are building uh, a future community that we'll, we'll all be proud of, and, and frankly, it's volunteer service, and I uh, know that at least I appreciate it, so thank you. Um, and thank you to all of you for, for joining. I mean, it's such a, it's really exciting to see so many people um, with such diversity on this uh, on this call. I think this is a very important topic. In, in fact, I think it's the most important topic if we think about the future of our province. Um, we talk a lot in the press and in, you know, around uh, our dining tables and virtual dining tables right now around economic resilience. Um, and economies are just uh, GDP, which is just capital plus labor. And I have a belief fundamentally at its core that, you know, capital will go anywhere there's an opportunity to earn a return. You know, you can wire money to China, to the UK, to South America. It's not difficult. And if there's a good return, you'll do that. And I think that investors do do that. So the differentiation, in my opinion, amongst economies, whether that's internationally or within Canada, is actually the differentiation of labor. Uh, having higher quality and more high quality, highly trained uh, labor is uh, how I think economies grow and, and, and are resilient. And so when I think about like the future of our province and attracting and retaining talent, you know, in a more or less unstructured way, but let me offer one piece of structure. I think there's things around pulling talent in and not pushing talent away. So first, how do we think about pulling talent in? I think you have to build a city or cities in which people view uh, the amenities as being attractive. And so we have some natural advantages in Alberta with our, uh, with our environment uh, and natural disadvantages as well with our environment. It is relatively cold relative to places like Vancouver or Halifax, uh, but we can't change those things. We can change our amenities. And I reflect on cities like New York and San Francisco and London or even Austin, Texas, and think about why do people naturally gravitate to those cities or even Vancouver or Toronto? And I think it's because of the amenities that those cities offer. It's the quality of life that they offer. It's the, the restaurant scene, the cultural scene, the nightlife, uh, the public infrastructure, the art galleries, the public transportation. They're livable cities from a quality of life perspective. And so I think as we think about the future of our province, we need to think about building amenities that people see as attractive. This importantly, when we talk about quality of life, it's not about cost of life. I unfortunately confuse the two. We talk a lot about it being a low cost place to live. 
That's not actually what people move for. If that was the case, people would have moved to Toronto. They wouldn't move to San Francisco. They wouldn't move to New York. These are very expensive. They wouldn't move to Vancouver. These are very expensive places to live. And so we know empirically that actually cost of living is not what drives this decision. It's quality of living that actually drives this decision. And so when we think about underinvesting and maybe having lower taxes than others, but actually having less quality of life, that's actually a challenge. And so I think we have to think through, through how do we create amenities that, that pull people in. Um, and then I talked a little bit, uh, or I just mentioned, uh, what, what, we, what, what is a, the, the piece that I mean about not pushing talent away? I think we have to have a rhetoric and a tone, uh, and frankly, institutions that, that aren't exclusionary and don't have people ask, is this a place for me? And so what do I mean by that? When I read in the press that our police force in Calgary is an example is misogynistic or our fire department is racist, um, that's a challenge. That's a challenge. And it's a challenge because if you think about universities and the people that are coming out of universities, um, they, they are more than half of them are women. They're more likely to be BIPOC than the average population. And so if we want to create an environment that actually keeps these people, doesn't push them away to say, this is not a city that speaks to me. Um, I think we have to deal with these challenges. The fact that we're not as citizens pounding the table saying this is unacceptable is in and of itself a signal. The fact that sometimes we see these things in our press uh, as Albertans is disappointing because it means that those that are here maybe don't see a future, they don't feel included here. And so we have to fix those things. Um, and I think that when others look to move here, and I'm in a business of moving foreign nationals to Canada, we have offices in Vancouver, Calgary, Toronto, and Halifax. I'll be honest and say that Calgary does not show up well when it comes to being a place that's inclusive, that speaks to this generation that's more female than male in terms of education, if those are educated, more likely to be BIPOC. So I think we have to deal with the things that are pushing people away. And I think we have to create structures and amenities uh, and cities that, that will pull people in that look like New York and San Francisco and Austin and London and Vancouver. Chad, back to you. Great. Thanks very much, Yerfan. That's a really good uh, framing for uh, for the rest of the conversation. So I appreciate that. Um, there was a request for me to make sure I, uh, I mention who the other speakers are going to be so that you can uh, have that in mind. So I'll just do that right now. The, the fourth speaker is going to be Chris Labossier. He's the founder and CEO of um, Altitude Investments uh, from Edmonton. And the third speaker will be Judy Fairburn, um, the co-CEO of uh, The 51, uh, women-led um, in support of women-led entrepreneurs, um, among many other things. And, um, and then the speaker I'll introduce now is a special guest to this session. Um, and that's Dr. David Finch from Mount Royal University. And um, David, uh, has has done some some re recent and very relevant research on this topic exactly, and so we've asked him to come in and unfortunately he's only got five minutes, but to share five minutes worth of uh, insights from from that re research. So thank you, uh, Dr. Finch. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I've never actually been a special guest before, so I feel like I'm opening an act for the Beatles or something. So uh, thanks again for um, uh, welcoming me today. So I'm just going to build on what Irfan talked about. My background's in strategic management, and most of the research I looked at is looking at the question of the allocation of scarce resources to contribute to a defined outcome. And fundamentally, that's the definition of management. And when you look at, you know, the, the model I like to look at is the inversion that's happened in the valuation of corporations over the last 40 years. So if you go back to 1980, the average company on New York Stock Exchange, about 70 to 75% uh, of the valuation of those organizations were what were called tangible assets. So they were um, machinery, they were resources in the ground, it was capital, it was things you could touch and feel. And 20 to 25% of the value of those organizations roughly were intangible. So those were ranged from, you know, again, people, things you can't touch, brands, so forth. Um, over the next 40 years, what we've seen, and certainly this is an Nerf fans world, is we've seen a total inversion of the valuation of organizations. So right now we've seen many organizations, we're looking at about an 80-20 split, where when you look at their market valuation, 80% of the value of the organization is what we call intangible. And, and I put them in three clusters of intangible assets human capital, what we're talking about today, 
um, people, right? Structural capital. Structural capital are the, are the process that allow you essentially to monetize the human capital. How do I extract the creativity, innovation, and knowledge of my, of my staff, my team, my organization? And the third is reputational uh, capital. And those are the three areas where when, if we dissect that and we start looking at cities and, and jurisdictions like provinces as an organization, they start, we, they become a liability. They become an at-risk problem for the province. Um, obviously, we've been a province we've, where our quote-unquote market valuation has often been tied to tangible assets. That is literally the holes in the ground, right? And the ability to extract that efficiently and sell those to markets. We've obviously got enormously talented human capital uh, in, in the province. And uh, the study that we've looked at is in Calgary specifically. One of the challenges, of course, we have going forward is the ability to mobilize that talent. And so last year, uh, one of the reports we wrote was called Calgary on the Precipice. We did it with our partners at Calgary Economic Development. And fundamentally, what we, we looked at is not just the ability to acquire and retain talent. The sweet spot for us was the development of talent. Because the future of talent going forward is about the capacity for individuals to adapt right? The, the shelf life today of quote unquote, what we call dom domain or task specific skills is under six years. So I learned something today in med school, or I learned something today in engineering school. I learned how to code a piece of software. Certainly within the next six years, that is going to be out of date and far, likely far sooner than that, right? Those are the domain specific skills. A study we did as part of that research was looked at the division between what we call domain specific skills, which again are Think about task-specific skills, whether you're in social work or an engineer or a nurse, compared to what we call enabling skills, right? So sometimes they're called transferable skills, soft skills. So enabling skills are, are defined as essentially offering the foundation to adapt, the ability for an individual to pivot and change proactively instead of reactively. When we studied that across uh, 15 different global competency frameworks, here's the interesting outcome. Regardless of whether you're a geologist or an accountant or a marketer or a nurse or an engineer, 70% of those competencies that they defined were essential for those roles were enabling competencies. So that means a nurse has a whole lot more in common than uh, a social worker, has a whole lot more common than a, with a cop and a teacher than um, others. 30% are domain specific, right? One of the challenges we have as a jurisdiction is the entire talent development system, starting um, through obviously through early childhood education, right through to lifelong learning mechanisms, are totally inverted. The accountability does not sit on the development of enabling competencies. The competencies stream in high school to focus on what we call domain specific competencies. That's one of the core talent challenges we're facing in this province. We built a province that is really, really, really good at doing a very narrow set of tasks and delivering a very narrow set of value. Um, as the world evolves and continues to change, we need our people to change with it, which requires us investing in what we call the development of adaptive capacity um, at an early, early, early stage in life. Um, the ability and you met, uh, the ability to mobilize that adaptive capacity by building the social infrastructure that allows us to be able to extract and mobilize and move that ta talent to areas that we can maximize its value for the cities and for the province. And the challenge we have is, as a, as a, as a um, province and as a city, and it's certainly not unique to Alberta, is there's zero accountability zero accountability for the acquisition, retention, and development of talent at the provincial level and at the city level. My analogy is simply this. Does anyone know any organization they'd ever want to work for that doesn't have somebody called human resources, somebody ultimately accountable for the acquisition, retention, and development of great people? Every progressive organization has established clear accountability Let's look at that from just a city perspective. Who is the accountable in an Edmonton or accountable or Calgary for the development and retention of talent? There's zero accountability. Um, and that inherently creates challenges when it comes to the fragmentation of 
school systems, fragmentation of other development opportunities, and the fragmentation of small and medium enterprises to corporate enterprises and social organizations that are effectively competing for similar types of talent. But no, there's very little co uh, collaboration and very little focused um, allocation of, of time and effort to try to coordinate that. So thank you, Chad, for the opportunity. OK, thank you, David. Um... Yeah, that's uh, the, the point about adaptive capacity is and is an interesting one to highlight, I think, given the situation we're in right now. Um, but um, anyway, we'll, we'll explore these all a little bit more in the, in the question and answer. And I do see that some questions are starting to come in. So if you haven't already checked those out on Slido, you can do that and either put your own questions in or, or vote up the ones that you like that are there. But I'll turn to, um, to Judy Fairburn. Now I already introduced her as co-CEO of 51. Um, also, uh, extensive background in the energy and innovation worlds in, in Alberta, um, including having served on the board of Alberta Innovate. So, Judy, uh, look forward to your comments. Uh, thanks very much and wonderful opening comments. And, and uh, I'm just a pleasure to be here in such a diverse crowd and perspectives. And this is what uh, Alberta is and, and, and needs to be more visible, I think, indeed, to the opening points. Um, I, I wanna, I'm going to focus mostly on taking a storytelling approach um, today in terms of some examples of the what I'm seeing is encouraging, actually, that this province is really taking some risk taking to diversify itself and that diversity is, is the core to that. And, um, and I think before I jump into that, though, I just want to build on uh, Dr. David Finch's comments. One of the things I found kind of neat is, yeah, with so much change happening, um, you know, what's called CQ to me is, is really key. I like it when I can remember it really well. Creativity, critical thinking, communication and collaboration. That's the critical skills that we need to be able to constantly adapt now, um, like you said, um, versus only the main skills. And I think, you know, a philosophy that I have, I think it's fundamental um, to uh, keeping talented people in Alberta, that we have a mindset of lifelong learning. I think that's just the absolute table stakes now. And that's the secret to being able to then flip it and see opportunities versus only challenges. And especially we know all the challenges that we've dealt with this last year and even, even well before that. And I know there's you know a lot of job loss and like, but on the flip side of that, um, and I'm going to mention this from a Calgary frame because I'm, I'm more familiar with that through Calgary Economic Development, many other things that I do. This province could use actually thousands of people with digital acumen. There are a lots of unfilled jobs. Um, and so how do you create that pivot? And, um, you know, if I think about just speaking from, again, the Treaty 7 Calgary perspective, um, and we now have a learning city mentality in Calgary and, and bringing together players and this bit around it's important to collaborate to elevate that, I think, bringing on, on the point that you mentioned earlier. Um, and, and then I think what's also key is, is to really see that and that's what entrepreneurs do. They see a challenge and then you find solutions to that. And in the last three years, we're seeing amazing solutions coming to the fore just to talk about stories for a moment. Um, you know, in terms of the programs that we have in this province now to upskill and reskill uh, for the digital world, we have what's in, in Calgary, Calgary Economic Development's Edge Up. The World Economic Forum actually has named this as an example for other cities to follow. Let's be proud of what we're doing here um, in, in Alberta and what our colleges, universities, many private entities are now doing to help um, our workers to shift. And what is, I just want to come back to what does EdgeUp stand for? It's energy to digital growth education and upskilling project. That's what the acronym stands for. And I think that's a big essence of what we're talking about today. And, you know, being able to take workers that have been in, in the, and maybe displaced in the, in the energy frame and help them pivot to, to where the real opportunities are now. Um, and I think the other thing that's really key that, that I think is, is really exciting and happy to be very involved with in a city, as many are you, is the likes of learning by doing. And, and those of us that are actively involved, maybe we're older in our careers, but we're still learning like through Intergen or through the Creative Destruction Lab and being mentored by, by you know, younger companies or in Edmonton by, you know, uh, what's been launched, I am YEG. Um, and when we learn, I think it shifts our mindset and we see possibilities. And that's, that's what I think is so key about. And I think we have to be talking more about this. This is why Next 30 is so important because talking about it starts to shift the brand. 
and when we tell stories and the like. And you know what's kind of neat is the last year for me, and I've been I've been around a long time in this province. I was born here. Um, the fact that diversification, digital, ESG, quality, diversion, inclusion is becoming more commonplace and mainstream in what we talk about in this province. Yay. Yeah, like for me, it was about time. You know? And and I know there's been job loss and it's really tough. Um, but but to keep our talented people here in Alberta, especially our younger generation, and it's really good to hear your, your, your thoughts earlier, we need to tell more 21st century stories. Look through the front windshield instead of the rear view mirror. That's what has to be very, very public. And, and you know, just on that frame, um, I love hearing about stories of people, Albertans, who have pivoted, whether intentionally because they could see where they wanted to position and saw opportunity, or courageously picked themselves up after a job loss and created opportunity. And just to hit a few of those right now, um, and there's many more in Alberta, some of these you know, some of those, these are just emerging stories um, of diversification, like some of the, we've all heard about, Solium, a tech unicorn, success story. The founders actually started in oil and gas and then saw opportunity, but that's their background. Uh, if ever, you know, geothermal renewable energy technology that's now embraced by global oil majors. That's a big deal. And it was started here in Calgary by those with an oil and gas background. Summit Nanotech, uh, Amanda Hall, amazing, you know, geophysicist who intentionally pivoted because she saw that she needed to position ourselves to, to um, be a leader in green lithium extraction because of the need to, to be part of the electric, um, the electric uh, uh, shift and you know, greener electric vehicle back batteries. Um, and then virtual gurus, um, you know, the, 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 both the Summit Nanotech and virtual gurus we work with, with the 51. Um, her, she's an indigenous founder who lost her job on oil and gas. And, and then started to figure out a solution for her to freelance and realized, you know what, this could really help a lot of others. And, and now has established a tech platform. She's grown tremendously, hundreds of people that offer virtual assistance to, to others. And, uh, and it's artificial intelligence enabled. So again, in offering solutions and tapping into underutilized workforce and talent in this province, particularly indigenous, rural, stay-at-home moms and the like. Um, so we have stories of, that have all bubbled up, most of these in the last couple of years, uh, of change and optimism. And, and just to close, you know, I pivot as well. It was a deliberate step for me to, to pivot from being a, a senior energy executive. I had the bug with innovation, with Albert Innovates, um, setting up venture funds and the like. And, and now that journey has taken me to the 51 and, and co-founding that and being an entrepreneur and venture fund manager and co-running that with Shelley Kuypers, who comes from a tech background. We founded it two years ago. We now have a community of 10,000. And our community is in cross Canada, into the States, into Europe. Uh, we've activated 15 million and growing rapidly across 23 women led or co led companies. And together we learned that's been the secret. You know, I think that's the key thing here around adaptability. Don't think that you have to do it by yourself. Together we learn and learn by doing. So, you know, I'm, I'm just going to close my thought to say, if, you know, if I threw out an ask to each of you today, Jot down one thing, you know, you want to delve into and learn that, that you are curious about. Say that to somebody else and uh, because then that'll help you to actually propel yourself forward. Because, you know, my take on this and I, I still, I was born here. I choose to still live here. That's because we, this, this province makes stuff happen. It's possible and we got this. So this can be contagious in a positive sense. We're going to keep our talented people in Alberta and bring way more in. So over to you guys, I probably went too long. <laughs> That's okay, Judy, that was great. Especially with a close like that, it was worth it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, that's great. I'll, I'll turn now to, to Chris, and I already mentioned he's founder and CEO of Altitude Investments. And just before I do, I'll just Thank everyone. I can see there are lots of excellent questions coming in, so I can tell already I'm going to have a tough job as the moderator of that Q&A in a couple of minutes, but uh, I'll turn it over to you, Chris. Great. Thanks a lot. And uh, also, uh, you know, many thanks to those who attended, but the, uh, the panelists especially, uh, uh, having seen the preparation they put into uh, their ideas and the thoughtfulness and the experience 
Uh, I feel a little bit like people might be underwhelmed to, to work, uh, as the last speaker before we go to break. But, um, you know, I, I guess uh, my background was we founded a software business uh, called Yardstick. We did a, a you know, fairly successful exit of uh, half the business uh, and continue to be a large player in the online training space. So, you know, technology enabled uh, software play. And, um, you know, my experience around talent attraction has been just the personal um, challenge of trying to attract people to work for our business. And, um, you know, my, my perspective is mostly Edmonton. And I can tell you uh, in 10 or 15 years of, uh, of asking and begging and uh, trying to bring people uh, to Edmonton, uh, we've never had any success. And so I think that, uh, you know, it's clearly a number one issue. Um, I think that um, livability is going to get talked a lot about with this uh, with this topic, and and so I don't think I can add any more to that. It, clearly, I believe it's the number one determinant of uh, attracting knowledge workers. Knowledge work is, you know, can be virtual in essence, and so there's a lot more control in terms of educated or talented workers to determine where they live, uh, at, regardless of where the work exists. So that's the reality, and I and I believe that um, I, I wouldn't add any more than what's been added on livability, other than I think it's probably the number one determinant. Uh, the, the, the one thing that I certainly uh, believe in my heart is that uh, all industries will be affected by this transition of the economy. I think that agriculture, resources, um, you know, retail, tourism, it, it's really all transitioning. Uh, as the CEO of Microsoft said, all, you know, eventually all companies will be software companies. And, and I believe that's very true. And, and, uh, and so I don't think we're talking about just an urban or just a tech uh, shift in the way the economy is going to uh, require talent. I believe this is true for farms and for oil and gas, obviously, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, social, I mean, the social uh, uh, applications in, in NGOs and so not-for-profits, they, they all, they're all trending towards having to be, uh, I think, more, more, have more digital talent and competency in their organization or creative talent in, uh, in their organization. Um, the thing that uh, I believe strongly in is that uh, entrepreneurship um, uh, and idea creation largely happens by accident in place. And I think that's the, the other issue that we have is uh, the more we create livability, the more we keep people, people in, uh, in centers, cities, uh, incubators uh, here, the longer, the more we'll have ideas emerge from them, like the jobbers and the solariums and, and stuff like that. Um, the, the idea I wanted to present, it's, uh, it's a little bit, um, you know, kind of, I guess, just a single idea is the idea of uh, education. I believe that, uh, you know, clearly the transition to the knowledge economy also puts more pressure on people to be uh, more formally educated and the role of post-secondary institutions either in the trades or in uh, in, uh, in, uh, in other um, academic pursuits uh, I believe is one of the major determinants of, uh, of keeping attracting talent and the idea that I put on my bio for the next 30 that uh, I never really explored how it might happen, and so I chat. I take your uh, I take your word at your word that I don't know how this would happen, but I believe strongly that it would be a really transformational, multi generational uh, idea for Alberta, uh, and, and not unlike uh, inspired from the idea of what the Heritage Trust Fund was one day. And uh, you know, is that uh, I believe the government and uh, and industry should uh, partner to create uh, the ability for uh, Albertans to access free post-secondary education. Um, it's not an unprecedented uh, idea. There's uh, many examples of uh, either um, you know forgivable loan guarantee uh, opportunities. You know, my general idea is I think that there should be zero barrier to attend secondary education or post-secondary education. I think it should be funded in the form of a of a loan to uh, to people, and then I believe that loan can be forgiven over time if uh, um, you know uh, occupational reg residency criteria was met over another period of time. So, say you attend school for four years, and the government uh, loans you twenty five thousand uh, dollars, so you can go to school tuition free and not uh, not uh, not on the basis of uh, need, but purely on the basis that that's an advantage of living in Alberta uh, and educating yourself in Alberta, uh, that you could pay that back. Uh, by a period of service after that, uh, uh, after you've uh, re completed your education, uh, in you know, in the form of uh, you know your employer uh, allocating a percentage of your compensation back to that loan guarantee, so it's ultimately paid back for by by the industry that needs the talent. And I think there's a lot of neat things you can do there. I would 
I mean, if I look at the cost of attracting an extraordinary individual to my organization, and I had to, I had to commit that if they stayed with us for four years to pay back that cost, I'd probably pay back twice that cost and, uh, uh, and let them keep the, the money for the investment in a property or the investment in a business idea or something along the way. So I just think that uh, that's one thing that's achievable. Uh, I researched very, very briefly. I, uh, I admit I'm probably not as, uh, uh, as thoughtful as some of the other panelists, but I researched briefly some of the things that are, exist like that out there. There's something in the U.S. that was called the Perkins um, loan um, guarantees, and I, and I just think it's possible. And the one thing that I'd like Alberta to be known for, uh, because we are also fighting image and reputation challenges, uh, is what is what do we value? There's a lot of talk about our values and our, our Alberta's values aligned with um, future Alberta's and younger Albertans' values. And I think if we can just project to the world that we value education and we value barrier-free access to education, um, that that's going to bring people here and it's going to keep people here. And if we were, if we if we expect some way for them to uh, repay that societally, um, uh, that's going to keep people here. And that and and if we create the livability that's 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 all necessary, uh, when they're here, they're going to accidentally come across ideas and they're going to start businesses and they're going to start. Uh, they're going to transform industries that need to be transformed. So it's, uh, it's, it's much more singular in conversation, but that's kind of, uh, I guess, what I'd leave with the group is the idea that it is possible. We know, I, I did some uh, back of the envelope math, we know that we're able to do loan guarantees as a province. And I think that what I'm talking about is roughly in the same scope of loan guarantees that we've done in the last couple of years to try to just protect one industry. And I think this would help potentially uh, emerge new ones and protect and refresh old ones. So that's my thoughts and I appreciate everyone for listening. Thanks, Chris. Uh, I love the, the, um, the pitching of a, of a single big idea there. I think that, that really helps um, instill some, some creativity and um, is actually a perfect segue for where we're gonna be going right after the Q&A into the brainstorm. So thank you, thank you very much for that. Um, I'll, I'll note um, now's the moment where we're going to turn to the to the Q and A, and um, you've all, already found the Slido, so because uh, you've there's already been a lot of activity on here. The first question that's at the top is one that I don't know if you were actually looking at it, Chris, but you almost said these words uh, word for word in your comments. Uh, do our values as a province align with the values of the younger generations? How are these reflecting our current leadership? Um, I'm, you've already said some comments on that, so I'll just turn to any of the other three. If you want to focus on values, um, how we can, I guess maybe I can, I can frame it as how we can make sure, as, as you were talking, Chris, how we make sure and signal uh, to, um, to younger generations that uh, the values of this place align with their values. Maybe we should start with David, because uh, I think that was a big part of your research. Yeah, thanks, Chad. So, you know, in, in, the, in our study, which uh, we co-authored with young people, so if you do take a glance at the study, Why Calgary? I would encourage you to actually dig into the four underlying reports that fed into them. We had a team of 24 undergraduate students work on four separate reports for Calgary Economic Development, which we then synthesized into that paper. And, and one of the emerging themes out of that was this, this uh, the, the concerns of values um, and how it fundamentally frames um an emotional connection to place and what we identified was was what we called a, um, a reputation reality gap in, in several different areas one was around um as been mentioned has been mentioned by by several speakers the importance of inclusivity and diversity um city of calgary research that was conducted with uh people under the age of 25 shows a, a very significant gap in in the area of diversity and inclusion um, between those under 25 and those over 25. Uh, the other one was around the importance and the role of being a leader in climate change and the environment. Again, a significant generation gap between those under 25 and those over 25. And then, the, and then the, another area that that is important is around the idea of, of entrepreneurship um, and uh, the value of entrepreneurship. Now, we have a notion that we think that, and I certainly see in my students, a strong motivation, desire to be entrepreneurs. However, the macro level data shows Alberta as a whole is significantly lower than most other jurisdictions in the country. Um, so there's almost this myth of an entrepreneurial culture here that is problematic when we looked at pivoting and adapting the, the, uh, the economy. So it's a, it's, a, it's a concern of 
the ability to instill the importance of entrepreneurial values far, far earlier in life that we're just not seeing at scale um, in post-secondary. Okay, I was just finding my mute button. Thanks, David. And uh, Irfan, I see that you're uh, keen to jump in too. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm just looking at these questions. I think that they're really uh, compelling though, for the first three that are up there. And I'd love to just offer my perspective on, on, on those questions and curious also to President Judy as well. Uh, maybe the third one first is the current job climate, you know, where there's fear and companies believe that, you know, your reward is actually having a job. The unfortunate thing for corporate leaders, uh, which I hope they recognize, is that for those that are in the highest uh, areas of demand, despite the overall unemployment rate, the unemployment rate in areas like software engineering and artificial intelligence, machine learning, product development, product management is extremely low. And so those people have choices. The compensation is growing dramatically. And so for those that actually, I think are, can play a key role in building a diverse our economy, uh, you have to offer more than just a job and, and, and strong compensation, honestly. It's, it's much more than that, it's culture as well. Um, to give you a stat, at this time last year, it's a US stat, but I think it plays into Canada as well. At this time last year, the unemployment rate for software engineers in the United States was 3.1%. Today, it's a little over 2%. I think it's about 2.1, 2.2%. So even despite COVID, it's getting even tighter. So it's like, it's more than full employment. Uh, and so I think we have to be cognizant of that. And in key areas like machine learning, the job vacancy rate, like jobs that are unfilled but posted is between 30 to 60%, depending on the Canadian city you're in, uh, with Toronto and Vancouver having very high vacancy rates. Uh, and the second question is, you know, what's the role of post-secondary institutions? This is game changing. It's such a great question um, because I think if you have extremely high quality education, like not good, but like fantastic, and that it's inexpensive, you use it as a talent magnet globally. So think about like Harvard or Stanford um, or frankly McGill in like the late 90s, right? They brought in like a quarter of the student population was like from the United States. Why? was a world-class institution that was really inexpensive. And so if you can do that, you can use the world as your talent uh, pool. And then the second thing you have to do is that now that they're here for four years, you've got to make your city a city that you don't want to leave. So they're, they're coming, they're going to, their trial is the time that they spend with you, but you don't want them to be a trial rejector. Who does this well? Austin. UT Austin, amazing school. People go to Austin for four years and they don't want to leave because it's such a great town. It's got a great culture, great vibe. It's a great place for young people to want to live and work. And so we got to do both of those things uh, in Calgary and Edmonton. It can't be good enough. It can't just be like, it's a good school. It's got to be a fantastic place uh, in terms of its quality of education, specifically for undergrads. And do our values align? I mean, it's such a big thing. I'll give you an example. It's like, gets really under my skin. Uh, the green line in Calgary is a debate. You know, it's a whole thing of like, we had it funded, it was billions of dollars and now it's maybe not funded. And, and I don't know if the green line's a good idea or a bad idea um, in terms of like how, where the stops are gonna be and like, should it go under the river? I mean, I don't know, I'm an engineer. But I do know that public transportation is important. And I think that young people who are much less likely to drive today than they were 20 years ago think public transportation is important. And if they think that the rest of us think public transportation and being good to the environment is not important because we're willing to sacrifice a project like that, we're not speaking to them. Great. Thanks, Irfan. Getting lots of uh, response to that on your in the chat box, and thank you very much for that. Um, Judy, there's a question specifically to you. How do you help? And, and you talked about at it and given you, you gave great examples of people pivoting and so on. So the question was, how do we help people who have attached their whole identities to a particular job or industry and how can they reinvent themselves to do something new? Uh, so this is, this is a tough question and it, it strikes me to, you know, this is all about change. And I think this has been a big thread of today, you know, and, and I've, you know, talk about adaptiveness and things of that nature. And I think, I think our younger generation and those that are willing to be risk takers um, you know, play a huge role here to be the examples and, and to show, you know, what's possible because I think in anything in change, you, there's your early movers. And I, I, you know, always like Jeffrey Moore's picture, you know, crossing the chasm, there's your early movers. And then there's, there's folks that are going to be really, really late adopters. And, 
And as much as we want those late adopters to see it and just go, you know, I'm going to make this happen, that's probably not realistic. But sometimes they can be inspired. Um, and, and, and I think, again, those that are, that's why I like the, the importance of stories to, to inspire people. And I think, you know, as I've worked in, because uh, I have a little bit of two hats, I'm on, on the board of a couple of energy companies where I can help them in terms of business innovation, digital change, uh, sustainability, um, and, and what we do with the 51. And, and I find, again, it, 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 there's lots of good stories of those where it's been a younger generation, they've been able to solve a problem the operators um, wanted solved. And then that, that has the operators understand that, you know, digital, I need that to be more in my life to, to, make, to make it better, um, to make my job easier, et cetera. And obviously everybody's had that big shift. A lot of people have had to be forced in that shift through the pandemic. But, but, but I think we have to think about this through, through how we encourage change. That, that's one part of it. And, and I, then I want to just come to a slightly different example, um, building from Irfan's points around the critical role of universities. And um, if you may, I, I want to just tell the story of, of we recently launched the Financial Feminism Investing Lab with the University of Calgary. And um, uh, Jim DeWalt, amazing dean of business school there, was just seeing so few women. They take finance, but then they don't stay in that profession. And, you know, I think there's some points, Irfan, Chris, others, um, David, in terms of it's just not a profession that it historically has given women a great sense of belonging and probably many others as well. And um, so we launched this program to have more women build up their financial acumen um, in concert with, with UFC and, and Canadian Women's Foundation. We were absolutely um, were way oversubscribed in terms of the number of women that wanted to come in it. And what we found is secret is when you want to have people that really aren't comfortable yet in a topic, but know they need to learn more about it, is you build community and you build a safe community. And I think that's the secret here where people don't have to feel like they have got it all figured out yet, but they feel they're in a safe place to learn. Yeah. It, it kind of, it's the concept of community kind of ties a lot of uh, what we've been talking about together, I think. Um, okay, we just have time for one more question, but I'm actually gonna cheat and, and pose two at the same time. They're both from Alex. Uh, and so I'll, I'll, I'll use that as an excuse to ask them both at the same time. One is the current job climate seems to create an environment of fear where companies say your reward is that you have a job. How does this conversation fit in? And then there's another question. There's a power gap with people that can make a difference. How can we actually shift this towards diversifying the leadership for future generations? So does anyone want to weigh in on either of those questions? And maybe I'll, I'll, I'll invite Chris because we haven't heard from you for a couple of minutes here. Anything to say on either of those questions? Well, I, I, I would comment, um, you know, perhaps on the first one. I, I think uh, as, a, as an entrepreneur, and one of our businesses is really essentially an entirely knowledge economy business. It's entirely web and internet enabled. Our clients are from all around the world. Um, you know, we, we, we have to compete in such fierce uh, ways for talent and culture is the number one uh, driver, amenity, uh, you know, respecting flexibility in the workplace. And so, you know, I, I think that, you know, I don't want to pick on an industry, but I think if your main industry are, is resource, you know, the resources are where they are and uh, you're going to find talent that will do certain things and compromise in certain areas in terms of their quality of life uh, for uh, economic benefit. And uh, but I think that, that we're not talking about that anymore. I, I, I just don't, I don't see it. I, I, I'm really looking for talent that knows how to, you know, product management talent, uh, tech, you know, obviously development technology talent, uh, sales, marketing, digital marketing uh, talent that um, it's just not good enough. And I think it was Irfan that said that. It's just not good enough for me to say, hey, you, you just be thankful you got a job because the reality is the, uh, there's just not enough labor pool right now for what we need. So uh, I, I I don't, I think that might be a phenomenon here that we're trying to, we're really talking about transitioning away from is that the only job opportunities are related to uh, resources. And that's, uh, that is definitely a problem. So uh, the power gap thing, I just can only say again, anecdotally, I'm seeing a ton of shift in the, uh, the voice that uh, everyone has today. I mean, we are all, uh, we all have the access to our own essentially media you know channel and and we can we can use our voice quite differently and and so 
uh, we have to, you know, we collectively, I guess, uh, recognize that. And, and so, you know, diversification seems to be, uh, you know, certain, certain seems to be, um, you know, definitely maybe not fast enough, but definitely kind of coming in, in, into the forefront as terms of what has to be important to organizations and culture development. So, uh, you know, those are my comments on those. I, I don't know if that directly answers. Alex's. Great. Thanks, Chris. Um, I'll give Irfan the last, uh, last word on this and then we'll, we'll move on. Yeah, just on the power gap. I mean, I think it's, it's initiatives like, you know, uh, the next 30, it's, it's about changing the rhetoric and changing the conversation. I'll give you two examples that really stand out for me. The first is, We've all known that there's been like racial inequality for a long, long time, right? But it wasn't until like BIPOC became a term and like Black Lives Matter became a term that people took it very seriously. So it was like incremental work and then a breakout uh, because the public square where the discussion was happening changed. And that's when we saw huge change. I think the same is true for income inequality. We've known for a long time there's been an income inequality. This is not a new thing. But when the 1% became part of the public, like, square in the rhetoric in the discussion that's what we said hey, maybe we should think about universal basic income so i think it's about having discussions like this that change the discussion in the public square then lead to breakout changes in in the diction and in our language that actually drives change that's how i think we, we we close the power gap okay great well thank you all four of you for your both your remarks and your um, engagement with the uh with the questions uh as has been the case in the past, I, I think we could probably spend the rest of the time engaging in all these questions. And sorry to those of you whose questions didn't get addressed, but um, we'll see if we can find ways to to um, to uh, explore them in further in further sessions. And uh, I do encourage you to keep going with what you're doing, which is chatting in the chat box about some of these topics and these questions you have. Um, uh, the, the, some of the panelists will stick around. I think some of them might have to sign off, but some of them will stick around and participate in, in, some, uh, in some of the upcoming sessions. So you'll still have a chance to interact. So thank you very much to all four of you again. And we'll move on to the next section called How Might We? Um, this is your chance to voice your ideas. And, and by you, I mean the, the rest of the, the, the participants in this session. So. Uh, we'll do that in a moment with a couple of questions. I'm gonna, uh, that's okay, and you can go to that. I'm gonna send you into, into some groups and just encourage you uh, to um, seize the opportunity to engage in a different kind of conversation. It'll be different in the sense that there's a good chance you'll be in a group with people you don't know. Uh, and for some of you that can be uh, uncomfortable, but um, uh, the feedback we've had is that for most people is that this is actually the highlight of the, of the session for, for most of them. So really um, encourage you to take that opportunity. And as you do so, there's, there's some guidance for you about how to enter into such a conversation. Um, the bottom two, the pink and the, and, and the green squares there talk about ways of engaging that, that might sound familiar, uh, talking nice, like if, especially if in a case where we don't know each other, you might just all be polite with each other and, and therefore scrape the surface and not really get into the details. Um, or the other can happen where you 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 know uh, talk tough, where it's about debate, where you know you're listening to the other point of view mainly just to find holes in it so that you can prove your point of view. Um, and we, you know, you're probably all familiar and had lots of experience with both of these types of conversation. We want to encourage you to um, try to to enter into these with the intention to have more reflexive dialogue or generative dialogue. So reflexive in the sense of inquiry and curiosity based. Um, you know, try to seek seek out what other people are really trying to say, and 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 then ultimately the best place to be in is if you can get the conversation to be generative, where you're connecting your own ideas to the ideas of others. So that's just some encouragement there. And um, here's the way it'll work: the um, in a moment you'll get uh, you'll get an, uh, a little uh, sign about where to where to go. And you can um, you can accept the invitation to a breakout room. You'll you'll get little prompts here. There aren't any facilitators, but you'll, the the prompts will come up on your screen. Uh, first step is to introduce yourself. So everyone go around the room and just say who you are and where you're from. And then secondly, share an insight. So something that resonated with you from the panel, or a question you're asking yourself about this. And again, just do a just do a round table. Third is. Uh, to share your personal story in relation to this topic. Why does it matter to you? What's your experience been with this topic? 
And then fourth, uh, and this is where we hope you can spend most of your time, is what idea do you find most compelling for Alberta on this topic? And that's uh, either among the ideas you've heard already or you know, the own, your own idea that you're bringing into the conversation. So um, don't feel any pressure to come to a consensus. You don't have to convince anyone that your idea is the best idea. That'll come later. <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, we'll, uh, we will have an opportunity to harvest the ideas later. So this is just a, an opportunity to explore and to share together. So I'll, uh, we'll give you about um, 25 minutes or so for this. And um, you'll get your invitation in just a moment. Enjoy. Okay, hi everyone. Welcome back from your breakout groups. I hope you enjoyed the conversation and got a chance to meet some interesting new people. The uh, expectation is that you will have resolved the whole issue in this breakout group. So I hope, I hope to hear back that you did. Uh, but uh, seriously though, we, we, um, we are going to take a minute now actually to just to harvest your own, your, your ideas and thoughts on the topic. Um, so hopefully that breakout group was some good, uh, good fodder for, for thinking about um, ideas and perspectives. The way we're uh, going to do this is I'm going to invite you in a moment, not yet, um, through Slido to, um, to share an idea. And it's going to look like this. What one idea do you find most compelling to help ensure that Alberta attracts and retains talent? And again, this could be your own idea. It could be one that you heard today or another one. Um, I'm just going to give you an illustration of what we're talking about. Uh, the next slide is uh, is an example, something uh, related to what uh, Irfan uh, shared earlier. Vibrant cities, build cities that are attractive places to live with exciting amenities like nightlife and culture for younger workers. So I'm, I'm just sharing that example uh, because it for this exercise, it helps if you can use the full uh, text count available to you, which is I think 300 uh, characters to make sure that you you specify the idea as much as you can so that others have a sense of what you're talking about. Sometimes in our early sessions, people would respond with like one word answers to this. And it was a little bit hard to kind of really get a sense of where people were coming from. So just encourage you to kind of describe the idea you're going to share. Obviously, it's still not a lot of detail, but in just a little bit more detail than in just one or two words. So um, that's why we've shown that example. So as I said, now is your chance to, to put an idea in and also to, um, to vote up the ones that you find most interesting and compelling. <laughs> okay, thank you for the one word answer. That's, uh, that's uh, a, a good contrast to what I just said, but uh, no problem. So if others can um, enter your own ideas uh, you, what you find most compelling, one idea, and then also um, vote up the ones that you find most interesting as they as they come in. Micro credentials in post secondary to promote lifelong learning and retrain for the new economy. Thank you for that. Lifestyle and inclusion are paramount, and they need to be broad based, anchored by uh, universal basic income. Um, our post-secondaries need to be more agile and willing to train students to think more creatively and entrepreneurial. Here's one we haven't heard yet. No provincial income taxes for people under 30. The development of communities that are attractive, robust public education and fantastic post-secondary institution that provide connections. Barrier-free post-secondary education, including trades and arts. Removing barriers to all types of post-secondary education. Make Alberta a destination for thinkers and people looking to expand their knowledge in all areas. All right, here they come. Consider the concept of the 15 minute neighborhood. And that one just dipped down in my list here, but to build our city to be more desirable and attractive ideas like the development of Calgary East Village. 
loan support, or free post-secondary education. Another one we hadn't heard explicitly mentioned, but Alberta's geography can be used to attract and maintain talent. We need to expand our infrastructure to allow people to work anywhere. If we want to fuel the knowledge economy like any industry, we have to fund it by giving students upfront grants to enter and post-grad credits so they stay. All right, keep them coming. <laughs> Actually encourage younger generations to travel and get worldly perspectives and then create an environment to have them come back and build better community. I think that's a, an interesting one. Sometimes we appreciate what we have more by, by seeing other places. Okay. Building top tier learning institutions that provide students with abundant learning opportunities and create strong recruiting pipelines into diverse industries. Really interested in exploring or advancing the idea expressed by Chris Labossier on free post-secondary tied to staying a period in Alberta. Foster a more positive, optimistic tone rather than whiny, entitled blaming and complaining. Okay, great. Well, thanks folks. Um, I, I see there are more ideas coming through and I'll encourage you to, to keep putting them in there and, uh, and also voting them up. As I said, um, you know, that part in particular is helpful to us to synthesize an output and to see which ideas are most interesting to the participants here. I, I, um, I try to avoid, uh, as, the, as the host and the moderator, I try to avoid um, sharing my own views on this, but I, I will just say that um, I, I do think that there's a, a huge opportunity here in the sense of um, the, the, the opportunity to uh, reframe our problems that we have in the province as opportunities. And um, the world that I come from just sort of the energy and climate space uh, is a good opportunity where there is a good example of that, where the, you know, we could understand the fact that we have high emissions in this province uh, relatively as a problem. We could also flip that and say it's a big opportunity because that means that we're a big market for people who want to solve that problem and for technologies and so on who want to solve that problem. And I think that kind of thinking can apply to, to a lot of different realms as well. So I just offer that in as a bit of a synthesis as well. And now is the moment where we're going to um, invite some of our other possibility panelists to share some closing reflections. Um, so they've been asked to try to listen carefully throughout the day or through the session and to uh, try to distill in two minutes some of what they heard. So it's a bit of a challenge, but I'll, uh, I'll introduce first uh, the co-chair of the possibility panel, and that's Emma May from Sophie Grace. And so Emma, go ahead. Thanks, Chad. Um, yeah, so we've heard actually that I think this is perhaps one of the better panels that we've that we've put on today, like really incredible insight from our uh, from our panelists. So thank you so much for everybody and, and the comment section has just been amazing too. So appreciate that. Um, I really come back to, for me, a lot of this is around brand Alberta. And I believe fundamentally that we actually have a brand problem on our hands and that diversity and diversification need to become foundational to our global brand and our national brand. And it's not right now. And we need to, we need to accept that um, because unless you accept it, you won't do anything to change it. So, We've heard many ideas today about how it is that we can go about doing that. Uh, big ideas around education, like what Chris Labossier was talking about, incredible. 
totally supportive of those. Um, investments in our communities and making them livable communities, not just sort of affordable communities. Those are, those are also super important conversations that we need to have. And we do need to continue to invest in our, in our communities, just like Airfan was talking about with things like the, um, like the green line and, and what we're doing in terms of transit and culture and how is it that we actually make these cities really places that people see themselves building lives in. Um, and we also need to start telling the stories like what Judy was doing about the innovators that are in our space, right? Because we don't tell enough of this story ourselves right now on a stage. People don't know that we're not telling the story enough about companies like Benevity or Solium and like companies that are really blowing it out of the water and starting things here that are uh, super significant. And, you know, right now what we've got is we have a government on, you know, that really does have a bully pulpit in terms of the national news. And those conversations start framing how it is that the rest of the country and the talent that we want to attract here see us. So what we want to do with this is we want to say, and that was something that really drove me to participate in the possibility panel in the next 30 was about how is it that we actually start taking a hold of this problem ourselves and changing those conversations. Um, a little bit on a personal front, you know, I, I struggle with this province every day. Um, I struggle around whether I stay here. I grew up here. I, uh, I'm currently the only member of my family. I have like five siblings, six, uh, who is still living here. My brothers are both in creative industries. One lives in London, England, one lives in Toronto. Uh, the rest of my family is on the coast. Um, and my, both of my parents have fundamentally left and it's my husband and I who are left here. I moved to Vancouver and then I moved back here because he had a really phenomenal job here. And as a mom and as a lawyer, I always found it really incredibly difficult to find my place in this city. And I gave, I feel like I gave a lot to my communities over time, but I still haven't really quite found a way that I fit in. And in fact, now I'm building a company that has most of my talent pool in Vancouver. And um, it's incredibly difficult for me to attract any of those people to Calgary. And they've told me point blank, they're not moving here. And there's nothing I can do about that right now because what they see is they see an ecosystem that is not willing to, that, that doesn't exist in the area that I'm in to support them. So when we talk about ecosystems and we talk about people moving to places, people have to have the feeling that they're not just moving for one company, that if that one company that they move their life for goes away, that there are still going to be opportunities in place for them and that there will be other chances for them to develop something. And so that's gonna be something that's exponential, right? So as we start to have these companies start to build things, people will feel like there is more, there's more than just this one or two tech companies out here that they can work for and that, you know, otherwise it's all oil and gas. So, so these are longer term problems and, and you know, the people, people on this call are doing amazing work to making sure those changes happen. Um, I think we also need to not dismiss a bit of the PTSD that's happened with the younger generation around what, around this, um, what's happened here over the past four to five years. I was talking to my 17 year old son the other night or last night saying, what would it take for you to want to stay in Calgary? And he said, well, I would want to know that if I had a job that it wasn't just going to disappear and I wouldn't have anything forever. Right. And so he's watched two of his friends, parents lose their jobs, lose their houses, lose, lose everything. And he sees volatility as an inevitability of this place right now. And so I think we need to address, you know, and that's what diversification and diversity, the, that's what that means to, the, to that generation is that they see an opportunity that doesn't exist only in this one moment in time, that they see a place where they really can put down roots and not face and not face sort of this ongoing risk. Um, so I know that's a bit of a downer. Uh, <laughs> and, and I said to Chad, you know, I'm not sure I can personally be super positive, but what I do know is that there are people here who are doing the work to get this stuff done. And um, I think we've heard some incredible ideas about how it is that we can continue to continue to make this place the vision that we all know it actually can be. Um, it's just, you know, it's just going to take some time. So thanks for the opportunity, everybody, and looking forward to hear lots of other people's comments on this.
thanks, Emma. Appreciate that. Um, I'm going to ask Brenda Barrett to come on. And Brenda is the um, co-owner and operator of Earthworks Farms near Stetler. And um, I'm glad she's going to have a chance to say a few words because we haven't really heard explicitly um, from someone with a rural perspective. So um, not to put that all on you, Brenda, but uh, welcome. Thank you. And uh, as I guess as a farmer and somebody involved in the kind of farming I am, Emma, I'm going to pick up on your word ecosystem, because I think that actually really summarizes even where my mind's gone in listening. Um, I think I have a question, this big question in my mind now, listening to the different perspectives, the different angles, that's really about how do we enable a population, whether that's a specific city, whether that's Alberta, whether that's, you know, Central, East Central Alberta as a rural communities to be the talent. And so that takes about education. So we've talked in a lot of different angles around education, whether the cost of it, but also as that got raised, I saw a lot of comments about even making sure that that then isn't limited. Sure, it's free as long as you're fitting into these boxes, as long as we know you're going to have a job in the next five years, because we're talking about the next 30. And so I really liked um, the first um, somebody said about the enabling competency. So this isn't about any education um, perspective, but also how do we build an education system that's about enabling talent, um, which is really about that flexibility, adaptability, proactivity, um, maybe entrepreneurship's a bit of a myth, um, you know, which some of the research showed we're not as entrepreneurial as we think we are, but let's go with that myth then and let's build those entrepreneurial skills um, and make it true. Um, and build that education system, I think. And, and even then that links to infrastructure. So what kind of infrastructure do we need to make that education work? And I, I really look at it from a rural Alberta perspective in that um, there are some already great stories like Central uh, Campus Alberta Central. It's been about bringing post-secondary opportunities to rural communities. So somebody else said, if you educate in place, people tend to return there, even if they don't stay there. And so how do we, and somebody else said, ideas happen in place. So how do we bring education using the infrastructure we have or also improving it? Because broadband is still a challenge in rural Alberta um, so that more people can even access that. So how do we build this, I guess this ecosystem that enables a population to be the talent? And that comes into the livability, um, public transportation, uh, broadband got mentioned, um, but also health and education, as well as the, the recreation opportunities. And I, so I think some of the same questions or this approach of building an ecosystem where people want to live and feel appreciated and can be talent, um, a, the, the exact solution might look very different in a population of 6,000 over a county compared to downtown Calgary or Edmonton. But yet I think the same kinds of questions and explorations and inspiration um, start to apply across that. And my timer is going. So right. Awesome. Thank you, Brenda. That's that's awesome um, for making that connection. Um, we're going to go a couple, I'm just signaling to people we are going to go a couple minutes over, hopefully not too much. And that's no pressure to you, Avnish, uh, who is our final closing reflection speaker. But over to you. There's tons to you. There's, there's, this is going to be a, a tight minute and a half, I think. Um, Th thank you all for being on this. I, I, I sort of, I love this position because you get the whole day to evaluate and connect with the group. Linda, Sherry, Tony, Alex, like thanks so much for the insights in our, in our, um, in our breakout room. Um, but I just want to touch on a couple of things. I think there was a, a couple of pieces from this morning uh, or sort of earlier on today that I want to talk about because um, David Finch's presentation around sort of this systemic consideration and misalignment um, sort of got my heart racing a little bit. I, I became very nervous, became very anxious about the concept of these systems being so deeply tied uh, in terms of how we've sort of mechanized labor and developed an economy. And so, you know, the, the counter action to that, I think is sort of the, the concept of systemic collaboration. We need to understand sort of who's in and who's out. How are we sort of finding those individuals? And, and when we think about post-secondary as a concept, um, I think that there's a, there, there's a renewal of, um, sort of high quality education that is going to sort of start meeting our needs where these organizations may not be. I would absolutely love for us to be able to fund those organizations in those ways, but in current parameters, it just doesn't seem like that's the plan. But those are the pieces for me that sort of all, all of a sudden sort of activate the, the work that needs to be done. And so talent in that piece, 
recognizes that who are we going to attract to be our um, sort of our city managers who are going to be sort of within an organization that are going to be part of our city planning department. Um, who are those like, the community builders that are going to sit on the, the boards of council right like the talent that we require to evaluate our own internal civic systems, not necessarily as a sort of a mechanization potentially of uh, skills for employment. Now think about the infrastructure that we work with day in and day out those individuals have to be some of the most talented. And so how are we removing the barriers potentially through archaic systems or uh, limited access for those individuals to be able to, to be brought along um, and for these structures to be challenged uh, in, in that way? Judy was talking about a, a learning city and, and I think the question to that is like, how are all of us sharing the knowledge with others? How are we building capacity and sort of the, the, the talent piece? What do I have to share and how am I sharing it with others so that they can understand where I may play within a, a larger perspective or, or uh, within their perspective? Um, and that learning by doing piece means that you have to bring people along. And so we can't do this work in isolation. I think there's a lot of success stories, but the barriers of people who are being brought along are a function of sort of the communities that we know. And we need to be much broadly, we need to consider that concept much broader in terms of bringing as many people along for this uh, in order to be effective. So there's a lot of great talent in our city. There, there absolutely is in terms of the definition of attitude and desire and wanting to be here and wanting to contribute and all of those concepts that that for me that definition of talent um, is absolutely here how are we now going to activate them to, so that they feel part of it are doing the work wanting to be a part of these things we as individuals that are sort of conscious of this need to bring people along so what capacity are you building how are you sharing your talents um, that's the part i'll uh, i'll end on thanks thanks chad that's terrific, Avinish. Thank you very much. And definitely some perspective there, points that we hadn't eliminated as much. And I, it's interesting, the point about um, sort of administrative leadership as well and, and, and talent there. So thank, thank you very much to all of you for your closing reflections. And that's really, really um, helpful to close on. And thank you all for sticking around. We went a couple minutes over, but uh, personally, I think it was worth it. Uh, so thank you very much. And uh, just one more slide, uh, I think, is just the uh, yet yeah, the uh, let you know uh, if you know to participate going forward. We've got one more session planned March 18th on truth, reconciliation, and indigenous opportunity in the evening. There will be other um, follow-ups after that. That's the one more that we have planned right now. And otherwise, you can see all the details there of how to stay engaged and connected and. Hopefully we can uh, ask of you to complete the evaluation survey that you're going to get by email as well. And yes, this um, session will be has been recorded and will be posted on our website and YouTube channel as well. Thanks, everyone. Take care.